All right, so let's look at this question. I haven't done this question um, ever. Uh, mainly on the justification, it's a, it's a tutorial question. So I want you to work through it and learn from it. And I think I would still say the same thing. It's meant to guide you through each um, exercise step by step. But I have gotten enough questions about this, this set of questions. People having some difficulty here and there. So I thought it would be good for me to work through, uh, work through the tutorial and uh, maybe highlight some of the things that you might have to watch out for. So uh, as it says, this question is guided tutorial for use of complex exponential starting from the basic conversion between Cartesian form and the polar form. Uh, to a basic algebraic manipulation using the complex exponential. Follow the instructions below, and so on. Use the outside the link. Is there an outside the link? Um, the Moivre's theorem? Uh, sure. Why not? Um, yeah, I guess I didn't link out to find my lectures. Um, <laughs> I thought I, maybe I did. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah. So follow the instructions below. Okay, complex exponential form conversion. Yeah, let me write down that Euler's formula. We are going to be using it a lot. Um, the e to the i theta, that's a complex exponential. That's equal to cosine of the angle there plus i sine theta. This is basically your formula for converting from a polar form. So this is the unit length of 1. Um, to a Cartesian form with the uh, real and imaginary components. Um, so you can convert, yeah, Cartesian form and polar form complete uh, below three exercise. Polar to Cartesian. So given the complex number in this form, convert it to that. Yeah, that's easy. So um, as I was saying, um, so let me um, just multiply, imagine multiplying through the whole thing by R. So if I do that, then this is what I get. R times the complex exponential is equal to R times that. And I can distribute R into the two terms to get the value of each uh, real and imaginary component. So let me do the calculation on O from alpha. I can see my R is 2.2. So I have 2.2 times. And let me work out the, the real part first that will be from cosine theta, I can see that theta is 5.28 radians, presumably, because otherwise, you know, it doesn't make sense with S degrees. Um, so cosine of 5.28, and I think if I just leave it that way, um, Wolfram Alpha will interpret that as being in radians. That's its default interpretation. I think that's right. Is that right? Yeah, I think that's right. So my real part is uh, 1.183. And for my imaginary part, r is the same, theta is the same. The only thing changes is instead of cosine, now it's sine. So with that, uh, oh, negative, minus 1.855. OK, uh, I, I, I don't know what 5.28 is in degrees. So I can't quite have an intuitive guess. And make sure you have i uh, for imaginary number. I think that's how, is it lowercase i? Uh, more? I haven't entered this in a while. Oh, oh I guess uh, the space is confusing it, I think. So complex number. What does it have to be this? I don't know. It's possible that if I just to put in uh, what it has, that'll still be right. Error invalid form. Yeah, so I had a minus and it doesn't like that. Oh, no, never mind. Um, all right, that must be right. Let me just uh, press the submit and double check. Uh, okay, good. That's the correct answer. Cartesian to polar. So given the complex number in this form, rewrite it in that form. So the way to best understand it is uh, the language that it's been using, the geometric language. So, um, so the I guess the correct way to draw it is with the real axis and the imaginary axis. But really, this real and imaginary axis you can think of it as x and y axis. So when it gives you this Cartesian coordinate, you know, okay, so minus um, like two point seven somewhere here. 
for the real part and for the imaginary part, minus 0 0.5, so somewhere here. So referring to this point here, this is minus 2.7, minus 0 0.5. Then you look at, okay, um, I see that's the vector there. So to turn it into polar form, I need to figure out this angle, theta, and I need to figure out that length, uh, which is going to be a hypotenuse of this triangle here. So if you imagine um, this triangle here, it's a right triangle with the two legs known, you know, 2.7 here, 0 0.5 here. So for that hypotenuse must be square root of 2.7 squared plus 0 0.5 squared. Um, and the angle, um, I think it's a little bit easier for me to figure out the, this acute angle here. That acute angle there is going to be arc tangent of opposite over the adjacent legs, 0 0.5 over 2.7. That's going to give me, and I think theta is going to be in radians. So let's say that'll give me theta in radians. And to get the total um, angle, um, this would be uh, 180 degrees or pi plus this arc 10 value. All right, so let's uh, work that out. I have square root of 2.7 squared plus 0 0.5 squared. That will give me the magnitude of the complex number. 2.74.59. And theta will be pi plus arctangent of um, 0 0.5 over 2.7. Arc, yeah, that looks about right. So 3.325 radians. That feels right. Um, oh, yeah, that's what's in the hint. Uh, let's see. Okay, good. Those are gradients, correct? One thing that I'm wondering, if we do accept the theta of... Um, so if you take this whole thing and subtract to 2 pi... That should still be a correct answer. Uh, is why it, there's no reason for it not to be. So minus 2.958. Let me just see if that's graded as correct. 2.958. Um, does it say, it doesn't say theta must be positive. Um, and there's a whole bunch of other answers you could give. But think of the way it's programmed, it doesn't accept any of those other answers as correct. So um, what I should uh, specify in the question is, and I'll fix it after the session. Um, the question really should specify that your answer should th for theta should be between 0 and 2 pi. Because I don't think that the question here tells you that. Uh, yeah. So I'll go in and uh, add that instruction to say uh, choose theta between 0 and 2 pi. Because otherwise there's an infinite number of answers that could work here. So with that, uh, fifth root using de Moivre's theorem. So um, de Moivre's theorem, I guess once you have the idea of the complex number, then it's, uh, um, you don't need a theorem for something like that. So let me just quickly write it out. So you have this number here, x is equal to 1.3. And let me just write it in the full form. Let me say g is equal to not just 1.3, but it's 1.3 times e to the power of i 2n pi. That is the full description. Because, you know, this is e to the i times 0. That's just 1, so it doesn't actually change anything. But when you take uh, an nth root, as in raise this power of 1 over, so I'm using what, fifth root, right? 1 over 5. Then what it is is, uh, I have this, uh, the leading coefficient, 1.3 raised to the power of 1 over 5. That's what you might be very familiar with as a, a fifth root. And that's one value. And you are going to have four other complex numbers that still satisfies the condition, which is that, um, so g1 fifth, that uh, if you take the g1 fifth, and take raise it to power of 5, that should be equal to z, or 1.3.
there are, there are four other numbers that will satisfy this condition. And all those numbers are found by looking at this expression. Um, e raised to, so you know, the exponent rules, when you are exponentiating, this uh, multiplies with the existing exponent. So this will be i times 2 fifth n pi. And at certain value of n, this will go to uh, 2 pi. So that's where you stop. So at n equals 5, you get e to the i uh, 2 pi, which is same as e to the i 0. So uh, so we are specifically looking at n um, between 0 and less than 5. So 0 actually gives you that 1.3. So let me enter that. So, uh, so and let me actually calculate this first. Uh, 1.3 raised to the power of 1 fifth. So that's going to be 1.054, so 1.054. That should be one of the answers. Let me submit and it'll give me a yellow check mark as an indicator that, yeah, I got one of the answers right. There's four more. So um, for those four more, I think it's going to be helpful for me to first have written out um, all the different values of the angles. So all those different values of the angles are for n equals 1, uh, I have 2 fifth pi. For n equals 2, I have 4 fifth pi. For n equals 3, I have 6 fifth pi. For n equals 4, I have 8 fifth pi. And once I have 10 fifth pi, that's 2 pi, same as 0 in this context. So uh, now it's going to be kind of a painful, well, a work, uh, cosine of uh, 2 times pi over 5. Um, so let me do this kind of in uh, uh, kind of in the order. So, so I have that 0 0.309, 0 0.309. And I'm just going to do all the real parts of first. And then, um, for, uh, and then do the imaginary part. So minus 0 0.809, and then uh, I skip to 6, 6, uh, that'll be minus 0 0.809. Yeah, should I have expected that? Maybe. That might be 309 next. We'll see. Um, yeah, 0 0.309. Okay, good. Uh, 309. Okay, those are the real parts of the four numbers. Let me now write down the imaginary part. That's going to be sine of the same angle. Oh, wait, wait. Uh, sorry, I made a mistake. Uh, I keep making this mistake. I remember making this mistake before. I have to take this. I have to multiply by 1.054. Um, so all those numbers need to change. 1.054 times that. So it's a 3 to 6. 3 to 6. Pretty sure, yeah. Wait. Yeah, three to six, and then uh, four to uh, minus point eight five three, point eight five three, and I think the rest will be the same as before. Five three, three to six. Okay, so those are the real part, and for the imaginary part, we just change the cosine of the angle into sine of the angle. Will be that. Or 1 1.00241 uh, plus 1.00241i. The next, 4 pi over 5, 0 0.6195. Um, that plus 0 0.6195i. I might start to get some repetition of some of the imaginary parts. Let's see. Um, so I'm looking at 6 minus 0 0.6195 minus, uh, I see. So it's this except minus minus 0.6195i. Um, okay, I don't, okay, it's gone. Okay, 8 pi. I think that's the last of our imaginary part, minus 1.0024. I think that's one of the yeah, numbers we had. 241. 
um, to be minus that i. All right, so I think that's all the numbers. Let's see uh, <laughs> if it gets graded as correct. Uh, yeah, that's all the numbers. Uh, it's a little complicated, but um, it, this is, I think, a one context uh, in math, in your math class where you saw complex exponentials. But it, this usually gets covered in trigonometry, and people forget by the time get to this class, or or your math teacher might not uh, might not have ever talked about it. It's the kind of the content that we physicists care about, and maybe engineers, but um, not as much with your calculus instructors. Uh, okay, algebraic manipulation example. In this next set of exercises, we are going to prov prove a useful statement in two ways. First by using real value trick functions, next by using complex exponential representation. Okay, following is a true general statement. Um, period is represented in general by, yeah, the trick function plus phi. Um, yeah, the same period oscillation can be represented by that, yeah. So when, when you have a phase factor, you can just put it into your, as an argument of the trick function. But if you have a, like a, some sum of cosine and sine, they can actually be represented this way. Some amplitude and some phase factor. You know, same two kind of um, degree of freedom. So by, in other words, that, yeah. We'll come up with the formulas for B and C in terms of, yeah. Oh, I guess that's a, a whole entirely real function based. All right, so yeah, this is what we are proving. So the first method using real function, um, expand out the left-hand side uh, with using angulation formula, expand it out this way. Okay, so I think what I'm basically trying to do here is write out what is cosine of omega t plus phi. Let me expand out cosine of omega t plus phi. So when you do that, so I'm using this uh, uh, cosine angle addition formula that says cosine of alpha plus beta is equal to cosine alpha cosine beta minus sine alpha sine beta. This is one of the few uh, useful formulas that I can't quite seem to remember how to drive, which is why I have it memorized so that I never have to drive it. So applying that, uh, what you're getting is cosine of omega t, okay, that's that, times cosine of phi minus sine of alpha, so omega t times the sine of phi. Okay, they already put in cosine of omega t for us. It concerns me a little bit, so this should be cosine of phi, concerns me a little bit, they do the same thing to the next one. Oh, I think it might be because it's a sine of omega t, so they wanted you to figure that out for yourself. They don't want to tell you that it's the depending on cosine, it depends on sine. Times the sine of phi. I think that's everything. Uh, let's plug it in and see. Um, okay. There's a chance that this is. Oh, oh, I know. There's a minus sign here that I am forgetting. Because um, there's a minus sign there. Okay. So hopefully that's what I was missing. Um, yeah, yeah, good. So they do expect you to type in sine of omega t. Good. No programming error. Mm -hmm. uh, for this equality to hold for all time, the coefficients to the cosine omega t on the left-hand side, right-hand side should be equal to each other. The coefficient sine on the left-hand side should be equal to each other. Collecting the like terms, uh, comparing the like terms, filling the belong by comparing the like terms, yeah. So... Yeah, so, so the by equality, this is what they mean. Um, so this was the that left-hand side there. So this is, so uh, writing it out, this is what you have. A times all of that. So, and I'm going to write uh, cos, things that depend on omega t last, because that's how it's set up here. So I'll say uh, uh, left-hand side, A times that cosine phi. Um, times cosine of omega t minus, uh, still a, a times sine phi times uh, sine of omega t. So that's the left-hand side. And what the question was saying was, you, you want to say this is equal to b times cosine of omega t plus c times sine of omega t. And we don't want to set this equal to some particular value of time. 
we want to be able to say that this is true for all values of tau. Once you are setting a bar that high, what you need to happen is this coefficient must be equal to that coefficient, and uh, this coefficient must be equal to that coefficient. So, oh, I think that's our answer for B and C. So let me just write that out. B should be A times cosine of phi, and C should be, there's some minus sign there, let's hope that's right, minus A times sine of phi. Okay, good. Now we can wrap up this uh, derivation. Uh, let's see. Let's just erase some of this. Uh, from above result, you have a B and C, right, uh, as a function of A and phi, good. By inverting this relationship, you can express A and phi in terms of B and C. Fill in the blanks below. Okay, I gotta throw some picture here. <laughs> so, uh, uh, to make sure that my uh, understanding of geometry isn't compromised by something. Um, so, um, B is the thing that goes with the cosine, so I'm going to associate with the x-axis. Um, C is uh, the one that's associated with sine, so I'm going to label it y-axis. Looks like it, that's going to be negative, so unless, uh, you know, uh, well, depending on value of phi, but assuming. <laughs> So I think our point is maybe somewhere here. So this is going to be a cosine phi, and this is going to be a sine phi, or you know, minus a sine phi. So um, for the magnitude, you look at this as a right triangle, where you know the values of the legs. This leg is that, this leg is that. Um, for find, to find the hypotenuse here, uh, you use Pythagorean theorem. So um, a here is equal to square root of this a cosine phi squared plus minus a sine theta theta. I think I meant a phi. Um, minus a sine phi um, squared. So squaring is going to get rid of the minus sign, so it'll be a squared times sine squared phi. I keep writing theta as I'm saying phi. Um, phi. So in this, I think, um, yeah, am I missing something? Um, by inverting this, you can express A and phi in terms of B and C. Oh, oh, so I'm writing it in terms of the wrong thing. So um, this a cosine phi, that is b. So this thing is b squared. And this is a minus a sine phi, that is c. So this thing is uh, c squared. And what I just say is uh, it doesn't simplify anymore from that. So the a in terms of b and c will be b squared plus uh, c squared. Let's look. Uh, tangent phi. So... Um, that would be uh, this angle here. And so, so I can write it this way. Uh, tangent is opposite over the adjacent. So it will be um, minus a sine phi divided by a cosine phi. So with that, um, the so tangent phi is a's cancel out, so you have minus a sine phi. Am I? I'm doing something. Um, oh, I think I was making this mistake before, and I did it again. So um, instead of labeling sides with a cosine phi and a sine phi, what you should be labeling them with is this here, that is b, and this here, that is c. So tangent phi is the opposite C over B. That's what um, it should be, not anything more complicated. So C over B. Okay, let's see if I got those two right. And then there's some exciting promise of a second method to the same calculation. Okay. Oh, wait, did I miss it? Oh, wait, this should be square root of that. Um, and what did I miss for tangent phi? Um, 
is it complaining because the C is a negative? That shouldn't matter. Um, P is opposite over adjacent. I mean, I could have put in a minus sign, but I don't think that actually should matter. Uh, Is that right? I feel like so C is yeah you know I don't think this insistence on minus sign is actually right because um, the way it's written here the C is actually uh, it contains minus sign within itself so for this scenario where the ratio would be negative, it would be negative from C being negative. So let me fix that. So the way I'm going to fix it is actually I'll make it accept both answers, C over B and minus C over B. And the actual correct answer is actually C over B. Um, let's do the second method. <laughs> so you're going to do the same calculation as above, but using complex representation. So this is the complex version of that expression above. Um, yeah, that, that, till the, it's complex with the expectation that, yeah, you can always, um, just take out the imaginary part, just deal with the real part, and that'll give you the original real function it was based on. The second term has been rewritten using the identity that, yeah, so this is like the one where the real part will give you cosine, this is one where the real part will give you sine. Using exponential algebra, we can expand the left-hand side. Let's give that a try. Uh, I think it's been quite some time since I've done it. So, so I'm going to erase all this. This is using trig function. As you can see, I've had to memorize this um, trig identity, and it does involve rather complicated application of it. So let's now do the exponential algebra instead. One of the nicest uh, thing about exponential complex exponential is that it eliminates need to memorize uh, trig identities in most the cases. So using the second method, um, we have uh, expand out the still again to come. Yeah, so we have that second term has been rewritten. I already read that. Expand out the left hand side and fill in the blank below. Okay, so I have a times e to the uh, i omega t plus v uh, and I want to write it out so that e to the i omega t is by itself and everything else okay um, so that would be so I can distribute this to get a times e to the i omega t plus i times v and exponential algebra says that when I have this I can rewrite it this way e to the i omega t times e to the i v. Ah, so I can pull this out to the right and this is just the remains. So what the question is looking for is this a times e to the i v times e to the i omega t. Let's give that a try. a times exponential of i times v. That sounds simple. Too simple. <laughs> Yeah, but it's right. Okay, good. We can do a similar expansion on the right hand side. Yeah, so this expansion was left hand side. So let me just uh, um, preserve this and get rid of everything else. So this was just the manipulation on the left hand side. And we ended with this. And we are going to do similar manipulation for the right hand side. So for the right hand side, we have, um, oh, where is it? Factor out the common factor of e. To, so let me just do the expansion on the right hand side. B times e to the i omega t. There's nothing to expand here. Plus c times. And I'm just going to do this expansion in my head to get e to the minus um, i pi over 2 times e to the i omega t. So uh, factoring things out, you get um, b plus. Um, and this is, well, let me leave it this way for now. And if I need to simplify it a little further, then I can do it later. Times e to the i omega t. So um, so let me 
equate the two expanded out expressions. So we are saying that is equal to this. Okay, and what is it? Uh, factor out that, cancel it from both sides, yeah. And you are allowed to cancel it because in, in this scenario, what we are saying is that this equality holds for all values of t. So you don't have to worry about e to the i omega t being zero. One, it can't be zero. Two, uh, even if it's a real part, it could be zero. We are considering, well, let's consider for values of t where it's not zero. So you can cancel it out. Then you have a e to the i phi is that. Uh, Simplify any constant complex numbers. Oh, oh, so I think uh, this I need to simplify. So um, that's, uh, you know, so using uh, Euler's formula, that's a cosine of minus pi over 2 plus a sine of minus pi over 2. Pi over 2 is 90 degrees, so that's a 0. Uh, there's an i here, i times that. That's a uh, uh, minus i. Uh, so or you know i times minus one so minus i so this should be rewritten as uh, minus i meaning this entire thing is equal to b minus i times c okay so that e to the i a times e to the i phi is equal to b minus i times c i think Yeah, so what we have shown is that you can write this as that where, so so what we have on the left-hand side is the A tilde. The, it's the complex number which can be written in this Cartesian expression um, that contains the phase factor. Um, so you can choose to, yeah, Cartesian polar form like this or Cartesian form like that. Um, Yeah, is that why I keep insisting this tangent phi is, I don't know. I'm still trying to, um, in the end, I, I think uh, whatever educational value that minus sign has, whether that's correct or not, I think uh, um, that uh, overcome by just the complication. So I'm just going to make it accept both the positive and negative answer. And, and let me not opine on which one's correct. <laughs> so I'm confusing myself, you know. So that's the tutorial exercise. It's a really, um, uh, the main thing I want you to get out of it is some familiarity of working with the complex exponentials. This is something that's going to really simplify a lot of interference calculations as you will see me lecture on. And uh, when we get to quantum mechanics, we have to use complex exponentials. There's no other way to write down time-dependent Schrodinger equation without involving complex exponentials. So, um, so I wanted to do this proper intro to complex exponentials um, while we have some time within the optics.